and uh, he's done engineering uh, all over the country, but a lot of it in, in Illinois. So let's, uh, let's jump right in and get started. So there's our introductions and our, our names there. Uh, Sean Dolan and Kirk Harnack, TELUS Alliance. We're going to talk about uh, SIP and VoIP specifically for broadcasters. What, why, uh, how, and, and, and how much. You know, one of the big problems is the aging uh, physical plant of the um, incumbent telephone companies. And um, the left-hand picture is one I just found off the Internet, but, you know, you drive down any road and you, you see pedestals that are falling apart like that and open and water getting into them and rusting. The picture on the right is a brand-new installation of a POTS line to one of my transmitter sites. That's how they did it. Uh, the, 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 and you can't see it on the pole, but there is a, a, a connection, a, you know, kind of a D-mark point on the pole. It's, it's not the D-mark because that was their cable they brought in and wrapped around a fence post. But uh, this is apparently what passes for telephony installations these days. At least it does in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, there's also a, uh, the orange sign on top of the, the up-in-the-air pedestal. I'm sure there's a word for it that I don't know. But the sign uh, warns you about a fiber uh, underground and be careful. There ain't no fiber anywhere around here. So uh, they just t tack up whatever sign they have that looks ominous. And, uh, of course, the, the reason that they came out and you know, reinstalled this is because the first one uh, went bad. Well, <laughs> this was in place for about three months, and uh, we've since gone to VoIP at that transmitter site and, and now at all of our transmitter sites. We've actually canceled copper telco service at every transmitter site because it was costing us money, and this is the kind of, uh, of service that, that we got from it. Um, the main services that we've used for decades, POTS, ISDN, T1, and, and PRI, well, you know, these are all going away. Um, let's see. What do I have to click to make that go to the next one? There we go. They're all going away. You know, back, it was back in the, um, oh, gosh, it, I think it's been a dozen years ago now that AT&T petitioned the FCC and says, hey, look, don't make us put pots everywhere. Let us put pots where we want to put pots. And I must tell you, at this location, at my house right here where I sit, I, when I moved here 15 years ago, I ordered a pots line and nobody's ever shown up. They, they did call to confirm a time and nobody's ever shown up. And I think that's kind of the state of, 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 of POTS. Um, ISDN, as you well know, and many voiceover people have called me and said, hey, my rate for ISDN has gone up tenfold. It used to be 70 a month. Now they want 700 a month. What can I do? Uh, T1 circuits, um, our guy that used to be with us, uh, Joe Talbot, has provided pictures of T1 infrastructure that looked like those pedestals. It was just awful. I um, mean, you know, good rainstorm, and it's going to be cutting off. And um, uh, PRI still around, but I got to believe that PRI, I is uh, just a holdover because it's so used in the corporate world. Um, everything's going IP. You guys know that. I know that. And we're going to talk about how to wrangle uh, IP into doing uh, what you want. IP comes in a couple of flavors. You know, you can get managed IP or unmanaged IP. Unmanaged IP would be like your 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 public internet connection. Um, and managed IP, you can in, in most places you can get a, a circuit that is IP and and uh, it, it's it has a service level agreement and it would be managed as well as an incoming PRI. You know, whereas the, the company that sells it to you is responsible for that physical uh, and logical connection coming in. Um, uh, Real-time applications for IP would include voice and video. Um, fragmented uh, applications would be like files and email where you don't, you know, if your email is delayed by 50 milliseconds, it doesn't really matter. But if voice or video is delayed by 50 milliseconds, especially over and over again, it gets to be a, gets to be a real problem. Um, we're going to use a couple of terms here. Uh, you go to some websites and say, what's the difference between VoIP and SIP, or are they the same thing? And you get a lot of websites and people saying, oh, my gosh, no, they're completely different things. Don't even put them together. It, within the company, within Telos, we talk about them uh, as basically the same thing. Although VoIP is a more broad brush term, voice over internet protocol, uh, SIP, uh, session initiation protocol, it's quite specific in uh, its definition. So, you know, they really are different things, but we tend to talk about them as being the same thing. Um, as I said, for our discussion, we're going to use them inter interchangeably. I want you to know something about, about SIP service. Um, I, did a, uh, I did a survey about three years ago of a bunch of different broadcasters and what money they saved when they switched from traditional telco services over to SIP. And they, they reported to me 50 to 90% savings over telco costs. My, for my own self, I kind of have a special deal through my friend Joe Talbot. Um, all my radio stations basically get all of our SIP service for free. 
and that's how little it costs. And if Joe ever sends me a bill for a few hundred dollars, great, we'll gladly pay it. But uh, it's it's possible to get this stuff for darned near free if if you know how to buy it. So quality, speed, efficiency are all up. You know, one thing that, that people complained about. Uh, having to switch off of ISDN. It was very reliable for them. And sure, after 25, 30 years of experience with ISDN, uh, it, it did become pretty reliable for quite a while. Now it's hard to find somebody at a telco that knows much about it. Uh, but remember, ISDN, uh, you know, B, B channel service, Great, reliable, reliable enough um, if you have your, your long distance carrier connected right and if, if they connect right at the other end. But uh, 64 kilobits per B channel is what you got, and that was it. And it was reliable, but that's all you got. If you wanted to send audio of higher quality, no, you couldn't do it unless you, you know, combined uh, a number of B channels together. So when people were complaining about having to go IP, uh, I had to remind them, look, you know, you've gotten used to ISDN, but you are limited there. It, it, it's a tariff service. They can ta politicians can tack on whatever taxes they want to on it, and I hope that doesn't uh, happen so much with 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 IP. But uh, you know, that's that's the way the world is. Um, return on investment has been really easy to show. Uh, when we first brought out the VX phone system, uh, it was my goal to show broadcasters, look, get off your PRI, your T1, go IP. Even if you got to pay for managed IP, you can still save about 50% over what you've been doing. And with that 50%, please hand it over to us and buy a new uh, phone system that's going to sound better for you. Another thing about SIP that, that you can do is it's it's flexible. It's fungible. You can change the way it works. Um, it's movable. It's movable on an yeah, you know, basically on an instantaneous basis. If if you've got to pick up and move uh, a, a system to another physical location, you can do that and and be on the air from somewhere else. You know, the a SIP server that's in the cloud doesn't care where you register from. It doesn't matter. Um, so it's perfect for business continuity. Also, uh, SIP services much more than fixed. You know, traditional telco services and the equipment that attends it. Uh, is g gives you a choice between a capex expense and an opex expense. So, um, hey, you, you know, you, you buy a few phones uh, for your your broadcast facility that are SIP phones, and that's a capex, but it's cheap. I got phones here on my desk that are literally forty two dollars a piece, um, uh, and the uh, and the opex cost comes with paying for you know cloud hosted services if that's the, the way that you want to go. So, in terms of a broadcast facility going with um, SIP services and putting that on the air. You know, lots and lots of people are, have done this, are doing it. Maybe you've done it. Um, I just want to get on the same page to let you know that this is no longer a science experiment. Uh, it is the way that we're doing business nowadays. So lots of broadcasters have, have gone to SIP services. Here's a couple pictures. This is WCBS in New York City. Uh, there's a non-Axia console, but uh, there's a Telos uh, VX system right there that feeds it in Atlanta. Uh, here's a picture of All News 106.7. And they certainly use a, a TELUS VX system there to do all their interviews and, and uh, live reports over the phone. Uh, this is also at an All News 106.7. And I've got some pictures now that uh, Sean has been on the road uh, uh, much more recently than I have. For me, it's, it's, it's been a few years. So, Sean, why don't you tell us about some of these pictures we're looking at? Sure. This one is uh, pretty obviously CNN. They use this pretty heavily for contribution audio uh, during breaking news. Um, as you can see up in the left-hand corner, that screenshot, they have the mayor of L.A., on the phone, on the air with the Omnia audio processing um, from the VX. Um, the next slide um, shows the uh, Intercom Chicago facility. On the left is a screenshot of the Instagram story of um, one of the morning shows I listened to, Gabe and Nina on B96. Um, excited for their new phones. Um, you know, they were very happy with like, the audio quality and they got caller ID and all the stuff they didn't have before. Um, it's also used at uh, WBBM uh, News Radio and uh, pretty heavily for their. Um, um, for their news desks operations, as well as a connection to their business phone systems, so they can transfer calls back and forth as needed. Um, here's another intercom facility, uh, KYW. Um, it's actually the um, intercom headquarters and in Philadelphia for, for corporate, um, used pretty widely there. They have 20-something uh, uh, studios plus 20-something um, KYW news radio desks that have virtual control of the VX with automatic split track recording, of the reporter and the caller that can be very easily bounced up to their um, content management system or to an audio editor. Um, the next slide shows uh, C-SPAN. Um, obviously, people call in and give their uh, opinions on whatever's going on um, via a few different phone lines, and um, uh, C-SPAN uh, uses uh, the VX for that. Um, 
Next is um, the ABC TV facilities in New York. Um, this one picture in particular is, is the Times Square studios where they do Good Morning America, um, Strahan, Sarah and Kiki and, and a number of other um, productions. They use this mostly for, they use VX mostly for intercom audio um, and for um, engineering core um, and interface that with their intercom system. Um, next is iHeart LA, um, obviously a ton of call volume there uh, with their syndicated shows. That's also um, where even though Seacrest is in uh, New York now, I believe that's still where they um, originate their, their phone service from and do their production from. Um, coming towards the end of, of the list here is QVC. Um, you know, it, it's, I know it's, uh, it's QVC, but it is, um, it is big business for them, especially um, when they have testimonial callers on the air. So it's important that they um, have, have their testimonials sound good. And also um, using the VX control protocol, they actually integrate it into their customer management system. So when someone calls in, um, there's the, the two systems basically talk back and forth. So the producer can see, you know, the, the producer, the, the, the caller's name, um, maybe, maybe their purchase history, things like that. So it's um, pretty big business and, and big data for them. And uh, finally, compared to QVC, um, is the White House um, uh, Communications Office, which can't go into too much, but suffice to say they're using um, BX pretty heavily for, for quite a number of things. Awesome. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the technical advantages of um, of going to to SIP. As I mentioned, you know, you're not limited to some bit rate. Uh, you can you can do different bit rates uh, depending on the kind of service that you're using, and you can use uh, protocols. Uh, uh, um, Codex that uh, you can't get with it with a POTS line. Uh, the main one being G.722. You can get better audio quality with G722 certainly than G711. I mean, who wants to listen to G711 for an extended period of time? I don't think any of us do. So G722 is built into uh, a, a system like the TELUS VX system. Uh, there are other codecs that are uh, available and someday uh, we'll, we'll have the license to put them in. Uh, things like AMR Wideband, which uh, is a codec that is of uh, can operate at a number of different bit rates and give you pretty good, pretty good quality. Uh, Opus is another uh, codec that that can be used in a, in a SIP system. Of course, SIP, SIP being session initiation protocol doesn't necessarily imply it's a phone call either. It, it can be all kinds of media that that it can be. Uh, obviously, with a with a phone system, we're and with the customer calling in from a phone, we're we're dealing with phones. But with um, with a Telus VX system, uh, you can uh, equip your station uh, employees, for example, with a soft phone on their on their smartphone, and get G seven two two quality from the field easily from your own employees. So they're going to sound much more listenable, uh, not and as much of a tune out factor as it would be with a with a with a, a phone call. Um, and a, just a, another dramatic uh, uh, example of. The, the cost being able to go down and get a, a return on investment uh, anywhere from 18 to 36 months. So the people that I, um, that I interviewed for uh, coming up with my own report on this, uh, it, it was dramatic. I mean, 36 years was the, out, was the outlier for a return on investment. Um, line sharing and studio mobility also become easy with SIP. Now, that would be SIP inside your, your facility. In that case, it wouldn't really matter, you know, how the line was coming in. And it's important to uh, make this differentiation. Uh, uh, when you're ever you're talking about SIP and VoIP, are we talking about it coming into your facility uh, as SIP VoIP, or are we talking about it uh, being distributed inside the facility as SIP or VoIP? And that's a that's a differentiation that we need to you need to have clear in your head when you're talking about it. Uh, but uh, obviously, if it's uh, SIP VoIP, you know, on Ethernet uh, inside your facility, it becomes quite easy to move things around and and, and to share. Um, SIP VoIP is inevitable. I mean, that's that's where it's going. So it's something that we we all have to learn and become comfortable with. Frankly, I became comfortable with it by uh, using a Raspberry Pi and putting a, f a copy of free PBX on it uh, that was already configured for the Raspberry Pi and just playing with a couple of extensions at my own house. And that's how I started to become familiar with it. And then uh, for my radio stations, uh, using a PBX uh, in the cloud, so to speak, actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny, the PBX that all 14 of my radio stations use is physically sitting at 
what was formerly Art Bell's radio station in Pahrump, Nevada. That's where the server is. It's it's, it's at that it's at KNYE, uh, but it and and it's it serves a whole bunch of services, including KNYE. But it's it's also got my radio station. That's a special deal. I'm not sure that's available to everybody, uh, but it, it is it is inevitable, and you can learn it. Um, you can learn it. You can use it for on-air talk shows, uh, multi-line, multi-studio. Uh, it, the Telus VX system is native SIP and VoIP. Uh, and in television workflows, this is really interesting. It, uh, TV stations are beginning to use this for uh, remote IFB, and it makes it really easy for people to connect in, be part of a talk group if that's important, and be connected to the correct studio so the correct director or producer uh, can, can uh, do IFB to uh, camera crew, to all the camera crews, to reporter, to all the reporters, to everybody in one truck or another truck. Uh, uh, and we'll have a short video coming up uh, at, near the end of this that helps further demonstrate uh, this. Um, the typical TELUS VX system layout in a, broad, in a radio station might look like this. You've got phone lines coming in, uh, in into the TELUS VX. And when I say phone lines, um, the TELUS VX handles uh, extensions. Uh, it doesn't uh, want to handle trunks. It, it handles extensions. So there needs to be a, a SIP PBX in front of it. And there's a lot of things you can do with that SIP PBX too. So the SIP PBX doesn't have to be on site. It can be in the cloud uh, or it can be on site. Your, your choice there. Um, there are also, we'll cover this more later, but there's multiple ways to bring phone lines into a TELUS VX system. So they don't all have to go through, you know, one thing. You can have failover. You can have um, lines coming in from different sources. Let's say you get a really, really good deal from company X for your, um, for your listener caller lines, for your request lines. Well, you can bring those in separately from lines that you maybe bring in from your own asterisk PBX or from your business PBX, or maybe for some reason you have to keep a few traditional POTS or PRI lines. You can bring those in through a gateway. So there's lots of ways to, uh, to, to get this done. Um, SIP is so commonplace in business settings these days, it's also becoming the standard for broadcast facilities. I got to say, SIP is kind of fun and manageable. Once you figure out, if you haven't played with it much, once you figure out what you can do with SIP and play with it and make things behave the way you want, it's actually kind of fun to, to get that done. Uh, I, I, I have found a little bit of, well, I find joy in, you know, typing some things, setting something up and saying, hey, that actually works. And it's cool to do it. You know, here I am typing into, let's say, the, the, the SIP PBX that my radio stations happen to use, the one that's sitting at formerly Art Bell's radio station, um, it, you know, you, you make new extensions for people and you change the way it behave or, you know, you fire somebody and you send their calls to the station manager uh, with just a few keystrokes. It, it, it becomes fun and easy to get that figured out. Or, hey, one, let's say your newsman in happened to us, your newsman decides that he needs to move to a different country and he's still going to do the news, which actually happened to me. Um, he moved to uh, an unnamed country and uh, we took the toll-free number that people called in for the news tip line, and we sent it to his extension in that unnamed country. So there's, uh, there's uh, so many things that can be done that are pretty cool and, and interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, Sean, I think there's some slides here that, that you have put together. You want to talk about these? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, but yeah, back to your point about it being kind of fun, it, it is really interesting to be able to um, do things, especially now in, in this kind of COVID time when we may need to forward calls to somebody's cell phone or may need to um, stick a, a physical desk phone at somebody's home so they can answer phones um, sometimes. It, yeah, super easy to do. Um, and in a lot of cases, actually, just unplugging your, your SIP phone from your desk and plugging it in at home, it grabs a DHCP address and it's connected and registered. So it's, it's good to go. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's really showing its usefulness and flexibility now. Um, but to go back to what um, McKirk had mentioned uh, a few slides ago, um, gave a couple options of how to deliver SIP service to your VX, whatever your voice over IP broadcast engine might be. Um, there were kind of two main uh, options. Um, there was a hosted option or an on-site option for your SIP server. Um, and for the purposes of this discussion, again, I'm going to use SIP PBX and SIP server um, as essentially the same thing, PBX being the private branch exchange. Um, this is basically the, the device, the server that takes um, phone service um, from, from a provider um, and turns it into um, extensions for your for your VX or for your endpoints. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the this product product uh, or project triangle at the upper right corner here. Um, this um, 
just is, is adapted from the normal project triangle to talk a little bit about getting a SIP delivered to your premises. Um, redundancy, of course, is having multiple paths uh, for voice services to your studio site. Um, convenience, uh, what, I, what I mean by that is, is how easy is this to set up? How much time is this to set up? How, how complex is it to set up? And um, in the, on the left, the low cost, I'm, I'm talking more about low operational costs because like Kirk mentioned, um, the capital or upfront costs for a, a new system, whether it be a new VX or a new SIP server or anything else that's involved, um, is usually pretty quickly offset by the savings and operational um, expenditures. So um, for the purposes of this, I'm talking about low operational expenditures. Um, on this slide here, um, I wanted to address something before we get started. Um, we're talking about whether we need to have a SIP server in the cloud or a SIP server on site. Uh, and you might be asking, well, why do I need a SIP server at all? I thought the VX speaks SIP. Well, it does. However, um, the VX, um, just like your, your office desk phone that might be SIP based, is an endpoint. Um, more specifically, um, the VX is a collection of endpoints. It is not a SIP server. It is not a PBX. Um, the reason for this is, um, you know, the same reason that we use um, standard IT infrastructure for our broadcast facility now. For example, for audio over IP, we might use a Cisco switch um, to get our audio from, from point A to point P um, around our facility. Um, what uh, this allows us to do is leverage any existing PBXs you have, or uh, if, if you already have one, just leverage whatever R&D has already been put into um, these systems by people like uh, like Cisco, like Avaya, like Mitel, or even open source projects um, like Asterisk. Um, we get to basically just leverage that and use that to our own advantage. So um, this diagram just shows that, uh, you know, hooking up a, a trunk directly to your VX is um, kind of like hooking up um, a fire hose, or excuse me, a, a fire hydrant to your, your, fire, uh, to your garden hose. Um, could it work? Maybe. Um, is it a good practice? No, probably not. Um, the, uh, the next slide um, shows uh, what it looks like to have a um, hosted SIP server in the cloud. So you see now the trunk is between the public switch telephone network um, and the hosted SIP provider has a much smaller pipe between you um, or through the public internet to you to the VX. What this hosted SIP provider server does is it converts that trunk into um, extension registrations or endpoint registrations for the VX. Um, you can see on the right side, the, the project triangle, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty convenient. Um, it's not the, the lowest cost, but um, it, it's very convenient in that you can go online, make an account, um, you know, say with somebody like, you know, for example, Vonage is a, is a pretty popular provider, um, and get some phone numbers and some extensions plugged into your VX up and running um, very, very quickly. Um, so it's very convenient. However, it doesn't really afford you any redundancy. You only have one connection um, through the public internet. Um, the next option is putting your SIP server on site. Uh, again, like, like Kirk mentioned. Um, this just establishes a trunk between the public switch telephone network and your on-site SIP server. Um, it's a little less convenient because you have to still set up your on-site SIP server and you have to coordinate um, transport of a trunk from the public telephone network to um, your on-site SIP server. However, it does usually save you some, some cost because you've taken the burden of, of maintaining a SIP server um, locally to yourself and you don't have to rely on anybody else to, to do that. Um, but again, this diagram, there's, there's really no, um, no redundancy um, pathwise between um, your on-site SIP server and the public switch telephone network. Um, moving on to the next, uh, the next one, um, is um, kind of a dual trunk situation. And this is actually a, a fairly common um, situation for a lot, of, um, a lot of broadcasters, including some that I had shown um, earlier that are doing some, some pretty big operations. Um, um, and you still have the direct trunk between your on-site SIP server um, and the public switch telephone network, but um, you have a backup trunk um, between um, or over your public internet connection. Um, from an over-the-top provider. This could be a provider um, like, uh, like FlowRoute, for example, um, where they'll provide you a SIP trunk just over the public internet. What's cool about doing something like this is that, one, it allows you to have redundancy um, via your, your on-site SIP server. Um, and two, this backup SIP trunk over the public internet is usually um, very, very minimal in cost. 
uh, you might be paying a few bucks a month, um, you know, for your, your phone numbers that you might have via this, this public internet trunk service. But um, most of the time it's actually usage based um, past that. So in this situation, your backup SIP trunk almost costs you um, nothing. And um, like Kirk mentioned, there's uh, in one of the earlier slides, there are a lot of redundancy options um, when using voice over IP that just weren't really possible um, very easily, at least um, with POTS or, or with PRI, you know, for example, um, even on outbound calls, of course, via the VX, um, outbound calls can be routed through whichever trunk is preferred and currently available. So if your, your main SIP trunk goes down, calls can be routed over your trunk over the public internet. That's great. But what's even cooler is inbound calls. On the provider side, um, you can basically set up um, a backup connection so that if your provider, your, your main provider, cannot contact your SIP server through that main trunk, it then sends the calls over the backup trunk, over the public internet, back to your on-site SIP server. And we've got it now to a point where the, the talent or the users just don't even notice. You know, you might, as an engineer, get an email that, hey, this, this trunk is down. But um, past that, calls keep coming in and going out. And, um, you know, you don't know, you, you don't know about it until you, you know, you're not woken up at 6 a.m. when the morning show calls saying, hey, I, I can't do my contest. Uh, you know, you notice your email when you, you sit down and look at your inbox at 9 o'clock in the morning. So um, pretty cool uh, stuff we can do. Um, finally, I'll, I'll show you one more option. Um, and that's actually a, a triple, a kind of a triple threat situation where it's what we talked about just now, but um, we can trunk your office PBX to your, to your SIP server as well. That's you're using uh, for the VX. So um, this allows you to make extension to extension calls um, to your, your office phone system. So if someone calls into the main number and they're trying to get on air, um, they can just be transferred directly on the air through a, a four digit extension or some other code. Um, likewise, if you have someone after doing an interview that you maybe want to talk to a reporter wants to talk to in their office or at their, at their cubicle, um, they can just transfer the call to their cubicle and, and talk to them there without any you know, interruption to the caller or making them call back. Obviously this option um, has a lot of redundancy built in, um, but, um, and the cost has gone up a bit because you have you know, multiple trunks here. Um, and the, the setup is a little less convenient, but um, most of these situations, it's almost a set it and forget it kind of thing um, where you set this up and it just sits there and it runs, um, uh, you know, uh, pretty much forever until, you know, maybe you have a provider outage or something and then you remember you have all this stuff set up again. But um, past that, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty seamless. Um, so when we're talking about how to choose your, your SIP service, uh, obviously, you know, we, we shared a number of, of options. You know, first it's just to, to look at that, you know, project triangle and kind of lay out your priorities. Where, where do you want that, that, that ball to be in the, in the triangle? Um, once you've done that, you can kind of use the, the options we just talked about to determine what you want to do. Um, and based on that, you can look at your capital expenses. And these, these would be like, um, of course, the, the VX and any other associated hardware to go with it. Maybe you have an on-site SIP server. Maybe you need to upgrade your network infrastructure a bit um, if you don't have an audio over IP network, things like that. Um, However, those are usually offset a lot by the um, operational expenses. Um, so keep that in mind as well. So look at those operational expenses too um, and, and see how long it would take to actually um, get your ROI on, on your capital or upfront costs. And then, you know, finally, yeah, think about your time. Um, that can, you know, that's obviously a very valuable thing, um, you know, now more than ever as, as everyone's being stretched to do more and more for more stations, more markets. Um, with, with less technology helps with this, but um, still um, you need to decide what, um, what your time is worth and what the opportunity cost of, of working on this is. Um, like we said, it's, you know, I think it's a lot of fun um, in, a, in a strange nerdy way as, as does Kirk, but um, you know, um, there are services that will make this easier, um, including um, ours, you know, Telos can help um, set this all up for you, provide training, commissioning, et cetera, and kind of guide you through um, this process. So um, uh, after talking about um, the actual service to, to purchase, um, we have to talk about the actual physical delivery uh, of these SIP circuits. And, and this is where um, a lot of people don't, um, just aren't aware of, of the different options um, of, of SIP service because a lot of the things online about SIP service talk about um, how easy it is to do over the public internet. Um, and that's great. And it is, it is very easy to do over the public internet as we, as we talked about. But, um, you know, for as broadcasters, um, in a lot of situations, we, you know, uh, redundancy and quality 
um, is, is very important to us. So when we're looking at managed versus unmanaged um, delivery of these, these voice services, of, of voice over IP services, um, it, it's basically um, you need to decide, you know, what, what your trade-off is, you know, with, with higher quality comes higher cost and um, with lower quality comes, comes lower cost. Um, to, to dive in a bit more, um, let's talk about, about the managed service, uh, like Kirk mentioned. So um, a lot of people don't know that you can actually get um, pretty easily, because it's very common these days, um, a managed SIP circuit uh, where um, you're basically guaranteed bandwidth. It, it's more or less the closest you can get if, if you're in a POTS or, or PRI kind of mindset. It's kind of the closest you can get to, to that, except it's an Ethernet circuit. Um, it's usually dedicated from a, a local exchange carrier or a competitive local exchange carrier um, that has um, uh, uh, guaranteed uh, or guaranteed uptime, uh, guaranteed quality of service, um, you know, uh, very low jitter, guaranteed bandwidth, um, things like that. So in, in that way, um, you can bypass the public internet entirely and, uh, you know, get your voice services over a dedicated circuit um, and, and almost every case, this is far more reliable um, than some of the copper circuits you might be relying on now, especially POTS, a PRI to some extent as well, um, because this is, the, this is the infrastructure that providers are maintaining. Um, this is uh, what they want to be doing. They don't want to be touching POTS lines or PRIs anymore if they don't have to. Um, and not only that, but it's very easy to get a hold of somebody at the provider who knows what you're talking about. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard to find someone who's very familiar with voice over IP and SIP over a dedicated circuit. Um, dedicated circuits are, are often MPLSs or, or IP VPNs. Um, that, that are, that, that's the technology that's used to, to guarantee this, this quality of service. Um, they come with SLAs usually. Um, the only downside, of course, is that they're slower to set up because you're working with these kind of legacy providers, let's call them, um, as, as we've all worked with, and we know things can be very very slow and kind of cumbersome to work with these providers to get these circuits set up. Um, however, they're, they're the ones that, that have the, the physical lines to provide them. Um, and um, it, it's a little pricier than, than going over the public internet, but again, that's, that's the, uh, that's the trade-off. Um, of course, um, the opposite of managed would be unmanaged. That would be over the public internet from an over the top provider um, where they um, provide a trunk from public switch telephone network uh, to you over the internet um, through their, essentially through their servers. Um, this is a lot cheaper, a lot faster to set up. Um, but of course, there's no quality of service uh, guarantee. You're going over the public internet. That being said, um, you know, the, the bandwidth requirements for VoIP are relatively low. Um, but, you know, so, so it's not so much a bandwidth issue, but maybe a jitter and packet loss issue. Um, so this can work fine. Um, I know, Kirk, like you've said, uh, your, your stations um, use the public internet for, uh, for their service, service and, it, and it works great. Um, others um, decide that, hey, this is, you know, it'll probably work great, but we want some guarantees of that. Other, other broadcasters um, decide that and go with a managed service um, and have, have really great results. And um, as I showed in the other slides, you can combine these two things um, for, um, for redundancy. Um, over two different providers as well. So um, pretty cool. Um, speaking of um, diversified uh, sources, um, on this next slide, um, you know, I just uh, just talk about, again, one of the scenarios that was showed um, where you can get a managed circuit from a, a local exchange carrier as your primary um, circuit, and then an unmanaged circuit, you know, basically a zip trunk over the internet from an over-the-top provider. Um, that's a pretty common way to do have redundancy in a way that you, you couldn't before, um, or at least if you did before, it was a lot more cumbersome and a lot more expensive uh, to do it um, with, with copper. Um, you can have diversified paths uh, as well, just like we have um, diversified paths for our, our STLs. You know, you might have a, um, some sort of a circuit over, over fiber, maybe MPLS or, or Metro Ethernet circuit to your transmitter site. Um, uh, as well as like a 950 uh, STL or maybe a licensed 11 gig or, or unlicensed 5 gig or something like that. Maybe you have a, 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 a landline path and you have a, a RF path. You can kind of do the same thing with, with SIP even if you wanted to. Um, you know, you can add 4G connectivity to your, your router. I'm sure Cradle Point um, is, a, uh, is a common um, manufacturer to many, many folks here um, that provides routers that, that do this where you put in a SIM card and connect an antenna up and um, set up failover and, and suddenly you, you have failover to a 4G data network. 
um, from one from one or multiple providers. Using an over-the-top provider over the public internet, you can do this very easily. Um, but you know, some some Lex actually can provide a, a managed service over 4G as well. Um, that just worked with one broadcaster faster that's um, setting this up right now um, through uh, Verizon, um, where they're providing a, a dedicated, um, basically a dedicated high QoS SIP trunk um, to the public switch telephone network over a 4G modem. So um, there's a lot of options. Um, in the end, in terms of um, when you're when you're shopping around um, some buying tips, just make sure to to you know leverage your size or associations you have um, with with other folks. Um, you know, if um, group buys are, are helpful, if you can swing it, um, maybe you have, a, you have a collection of stations, or, or maybe you're your regional operator that still operates somewhat in silos. If everyone can band together and say, "Hey, our voice services are up for renewal and are all for renewal in six months." Hey, Mr. Carrier, um, what can you do for us? Um, you can typically get a lot better pricing and a lot better service um, as well um, by um, by doing something like that. Not only um, you know pricing and service, but you end up getting a standardized install at every location. You get faster service. You get a debtor, you get usually a dedicated project manager sometimes that deals with all these. So it makes your life easier too as the engineer troubleshooting things if something is not working properly. Um, and finally, uh, if you don't already have one, you can find a, um, a telecom expert, you know, a broker or an advocate or someone that does cost management to help you with this. Um, so um, to, to start, just determine your, your voice over IP connectivity that you, you want, get the quotes from providers, and, and like I said earlier, um, Telos can give you guidance on this. Um, we can help you activate your services. We can configure an on-site SIP server if you want. Um, we can help you in discussions with a, a hosted SIP server if you have one in mind, um, or maybe your office PBX vendor. Um, we can have discussions with them to explain what's needed to make this work. Um, we can commission your system and, and provide training. Um, we also have, of course, plenty of documentation um, through our, our manuals and um, our online knowledge base. Um, if you wanted to, to um, have some fun with it and you had some time in your hands to go this alone, um, uh, or we start out going going it um, primary and in, primarily independently. Um, you're more welcome to do that, and that's what plenty of people do as well. So you don't necessarily even um, you know you don't necessarily need us to set up your system for you. Of course, that's a as a, as a, as a, a somewhat of a misconception. Um, it's just um, a lot of people like us to do it um, the the first time around. All right, let's um, take a look at the uh, at the VX system components. Uh, so you can see uh, how we make uh, SIP lines and SIP extensions work for uh, for broadcasters in in, in several studios. Um, so this is a, a you know, an, adver an advertising picture, but a, a typical setup. You've got uh, the VX system itself, which is a one rack unit box, uh, a server based box that uh, we're very comfortable with, and then uh, the what look like phones. We call them V sets uh, or some so and or some software to uh, help you get that that done. Um, Let's see. Sean, this is your picture, isn't it? Um, yeah, I can certainly talk about it. Yeah, it's, um, you know, a great way to, um, to think about the VX is that it's split into <laughs> two sides. Well, what's know? funny is, is later in the presentation, we were both Sean and I have been working on the same presentation. And later in the presentation, uh, I'm, I redrew a similar picture. And Sean, yours is so much better than mine. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so t tell us what we're looking at here. Sure, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we can kind of split the VX into, into two portions. There's the WAN side, which is really your, your voice over IP side that, that connects to whatever provider, whatever SIP service, whatever on-site SIP server um, you might have. Um, and you can actually have multiple servers, by the way. So um, you, you have plenty of options there. Um, that side also can have your connection to your VSETs or, or um, your call screening uh, or call management software. Um, on that side of, of the WAN or voice over IP connection too. Um, that is just something we mentioned because it usually makes implementation easier if you don't already have a full audio over IP system. Um, you can plug in your VSETs and your call screening software on, on the, the WAN side and route that through your, 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 business, your business network essentially. Um, and that'll make your, your life easier not having to dual NIC computers or anything like that or run new cabling. Um, then the LAN side, um, also called the audio over IP side, is, is just that. That's where you get your, your audio from. Um, so, you know, to your audio consoles, um, you can also plug in VSETs uh, and call screening software on this side of the connection as well. Um, you might run to your X nodes if you're using an X node or any other gateway. Um, you know, uh, we also support, um, you know, um, 
for example, AES-67, not just uh, Livewire, um, which TELUS is known for, but um, AES-67 as well. So for example, if you had a um, manufacturer um, that supports AES-67, you know, one common one is, is Dante. Um, a lot of Dante cards can be put into an AES-67 mode um, with, a, with a radio button. Um, and at that point, then you can get audio to and from your, your Dante um, cards or interfaces or mixers or whatever it is um, just over the network and don't need to convert from network to analog back to network. Yeah. W worth saying here, uh, of course, if you if you have uh, consoles that do audio over IP, um, certainly Livewire, AES67, Dante, uh, then this this can be a, just a whole lot of plug and play. If you don't, we have, of course, X nodes that a lot of people are familiar with already that convert uh, audio over IP into baseband audio, so analog or, uh, or AES. Sean, shall we take a look at the individual components here? This is what the VX engine looks like. It's in a one rack unit server platform. Yeah. Um, the rear of that, uh, it has dual power supplies and dual Ethernet jacks, uh, one for the WAN side, one for the, the LAN side. But what's inside this? What's it doing inside? Um, I like to show it this way. Uh, we, we start out on the WAN side with a pool of phone lines or more properly extensions off of a, 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 a SIP PBX. And so we, could, we register almost as, as many phone lines or extensions as you want to. That, that's not really a, uh, that doesn't take much CPU time to register a line and check in with it every 30 or 60 seconds or how, however often that, that the protocol calls for. So that's where your phone lines come in off of a uh, SIP PBX. Again, whether it's local, uh, on-site, or hosted somewhere, somewhere else. Then another part of what a VX is, it, it lets us make studio definitions. We define... We tell the VX what are the actual inputs and outputs, audio inputs, audio outputs in a given studio. Now, those inputs and outputs may be, uh, may be Axia Livewire built into a console, or they may be on, uh, on a VX system, or they may be Dante. But what, it's whatever, how many paths and where they are and how they're numbered and what their uh, multicast IP addresses may be, we tell it that. We also tell it, we also define a studio by saying, here's how many faders you have to work with, one fader or two, or maybe you've got a, a room where you actually put four people on at once and you control their individual volumes with, say, four, four people. This is also where we define the mix-minus routes, so we can define how mix-minus is fed uh, to each individual caller. Uh, we also uh, define the program on hold route, and we can do acoustic echo cancellation. Uh, that does take some CPU time, but if you've got open mic, open speakers, say in a television studio or in a, a, a radio situation where, again, you have open mic, open speaker, well, that is defined uh, and implemented uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area of the studio definition per studio. So some studios obviously could have uh, acoustic echo cancellation and, and others may not need it. And this is where also we put our GPIO configuration to flash a, flash a light or to, to mute some speakers, whatever you need to do that you would do with a phone system. And then finally, we have the show definition where we define which extensions, which lines are part of a given show. So let's say that you have the Sean Dolan show in the morning and, uh, and Sean uses, you know, such and so lines and people know those, those lines. You may have, of course, a studio, which is a radio station, which uses the same phone numbers all the time and the show may not change. But let's say that you do a sports show and it's got some different phone numbers and maybe it's even done in one studio versus another on different days. You can define, you can move those lines from, from one studio to another just by moving the show definition from one to another. This is also where we define busy all lines. Hey, let's busy all the lines except for the hotline, right, uh, so that we don't take calls right now. Um, so you can define also hunt groups in, in this kind of a situation. Um, and so here's how it kind of lays out. You would, uh, if you have a multiple studios, you assign different shows, and the shows themselves have different phone lines assigned to each of the different different studios. And you can again move those around if you if you want to or need to. Um, some of the components here, uh, we have a couple of these things that look like phones. Okay, they look like phone, they smell like a phone, they act like a phone. But they're not a phone. Uh, these are actually show controllers. Now, you can pick up the handset and talk to a caller privately. And that's why we, we do recommend having one of these in, in each studio. But you can also instantaneously assign a caller to a hybrid uh, with, with this. Sean, is there any, any feature you'd like to point out about the V-sets that I, I really hadn't talked about? 
Um, you know, not in particular, just that they're, yeah. you know, it, it's really just that it's, it's the workflow. Um, kind of like you said, it's, it's very similar to the older, you know, desktop directories, except with some, some enhancements. And one thing that's really cool about them that I've, I've got to see and you've got to see as well is even people who are not familiar with the older Telos products um, and talk show systems can more or less sit down. You can tell them about the VSAT uh, in about 30 seconds and they're off and they're using it, you know? Yeah. So um, it's, it's really, really uh, uh, not a steep learning, learning curve at all. Uh, from the VSAT itself, you can change. You can tell which show you want to do in, in that given studio. So the VSAT's in a given studio and you can, uh, you through a few button presses, you can say, hey, I want to do the Sean Dolan show or I want to do the Jeff Wiggins show or the Kent Baker show. You can, you can do those, uh, do that for, right, right from there. Uh, and of course, you can make outgoing phone calls uh, as, as well from there. Now, if a VSET, oh, by the way, these are powered over Ethernet, so that's pretty convenient. And as Sean pointed out earlier, these can plug into either uh, the live wire or you know AOIP network side of the VX system, or for your convenience, they can plug into the WAN side. And the VX system doesn't care. Uh, these are these devices themselves are not. Um, live wire, you know, high bit rate devices. The the audio that goes uh, to and from them is at, at a lower bit rate because it's it's just going to, to the handset. Some of the other ways to control a VX system would be through a, a desktop controller, for example, which you can put into its own case, or you can drop it, the electronics into your audio console. Uh, of course, Telos uh, also makes uh, modules that drop into our consoles, like a fusion call control module. Uh, on the new Quasar console, it's in software. It comes up on the big touch screen in the middle of a Quasar console, so you can uh, control the phone lines from right there. Uh, and there's an also uh, for the IQ series of consoles. There's an ex a phone expansion that lets you lets you do that. If you are um, if you don't have an Axia AOIP system, you're not out of luck. You can use Axia X nodes to get audio in and out of the system. And you know, most of the time, uh, if you ever used Axia X nodes, we talk about an X node as having four stereo inputs and four stereo outputs. Well, since phone calls are by their very nature mono and they're not likely to be stereo at any time in the future, uh, you can also configure these X nodes on an input by input or output by output basis to uh, handle two channels. So for the purposes of a VX, you actually have eight mono in and eight mono out with an Axia X node. If you're a station that is not Axia, but you have a central routing system, for example, it's pretty easy just to locate uh, an X node uh, next to your router in your rack room and then wire all your mono I's and O's uh, that way. A lot of questions that we get have to do with, hey, uh, your VX system, how many lines does it handle and how many hybrids does it have? Well, it's a little bit different than, you know, we used to think about a phone system as being a studio by studio replacement. Hey, because, you know, we made the 1X6, right? And the 2X12 and the NX6 or the NX12, we, we made these phone systems. And they were meant to replace a phone system in a studio, a single studio. And you had to handle the, uh, the routing of the POTS or ISDN lines yourself from one studio to another. And some people, you know, made a little patch base to move things around if they needed to. That was how you got it done. Well, SIP is different. Um, one of, we, we can talk about it having hybrids. We can talk about it having fader outputs or caller outputs. Those are some valid ways to, to, to think about how big uh, a, a VX system can be. One thing that we need to talk about is um, lines and what we talk about lines. When I say a line, I don't necessarily, I, I don't mean uh, necessarily a dedicated DID line or, you know, a 10-digit phone number. I am really talking about an extension number, which can be fed directly by a, a, a DID in the SIP PBX, or can be part of a, of a hunt group as well. But uh, lines can be registered. Uh, we can also put a line into a show. Uh, it can be idle. It can be ringing. It can be on the handset or on hold. And then a line can be put on, on air. And so here's how to visualize that. A single VX system can have hundreds of SIP line registrations at the same time. That, that really doesn't uh, matter. That doesn't take up any CPU time. It can have a few dozen lines, active lines, uh, assigned to shows or show definitions and they can be up to up to 12 actually we can do 24 lines in a show but 12 is pretty common six is, is also common for smaller studios so you can assign lines to a show and then you can also assign um, 
the the out the caller outputs what you might hear called the hybrid now this is the audio that gets omnia processed it's it's the best quality we possibly know how to do it's not handset audio uh, it's not coupler audio if you will it is fully processed it's the again the best we know how to do and that has a limitation that has a limitation on the number of outputs of the VX system. Um, we have a couple of systems, one called the VX Prime Plus, that has eight outputs maximum and can never be increased. There's also the VX Enterprise system, which can, can uh, by buying more licenses, can have up to 120 fully processed caller outputs. So, uh, you, you know, if, you, if you're in that position, talk to the sales rep about how that works uh, with, uh, with, with the VX system and the number of outputs that it has. So, um, for example, let's say you had eight control rooms, five prod rooms, and four call screeners. Uh, your outputs, you know, your count of outputs might look like this. Eight control rooms, two faders each, that's 16 uh, hybrid outputs. Five prod rooms would be five more, that'd be 21. Call screeners don't really take up any, any space. Um, I see that we're running a bit low on time, so we're going to skip ahead pretty quickly here. Actually, we're almost, we're almost there anyway, uh, Sean. Thanks for the message. Um, call management software. Sean, do you want to address this for just a sec? Call management? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, there's a, a ton of options out there for, for call screening um, or call management um, software that's purpose-built for, for talk show workflows. Um, here, uh, shown from, from left to right and bottom, is uh, X-Screen from Broadcast Bionics. Um, next to that is Neo Screener uh, from Neo Group. Um, and finally on the bottom is, uh, is Phonebox VX, um, which is a little more advanced uh, version, a little more, um, it has lots of other uh, features aside from call management um, on the bottom there, also from Broadcast Bionics. Um, these options are just something to take a look at and discuss with. The one thing I will mention is that X Screen Lite, um, a light version of, of what's shown on the left there, um, does come with VX. So um, you can do basic call screening um, in multiple studios, um, multiple screener positions, talent positions, et cetera, um, all through um, all through X screen. Good deal. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to, uh, we have this, uh, this quick video here. You know, we've been talking mostly about radio application and I want to show you this in a television application. So I shot this at WSB in Atlanta. I think I have everything set up right to hear the, uh, for everybody to hear the audio. Uh, Sean, I'm looking at you on camera. So if you're not hearing proper audio, wave at me and we'll, we'll try to figure it out. But okay, here, sounds good. here we go. Hello, I'm Kirk Harnack at WSB television and radio in Atlanta, Georgia. What do you do when you're a TV station with a dozen remote trucks, two dozen reporters and photographers and remote truck operators. How do you communicate with all of them when they're in the field getting ready to do their live news reports? WSB and other TV stations have used ordinary POTS lines coming into auto couplers tied into their intercom system. That was very expensive and it took a lot of space. But now there's a much better way using VoIP and SIP technology and using a Telos VX phone system along with an asterisk telephone PBX. I'll show you all about it here at WSB in Atlanta. We're in the engineering rack room full of servers and all kinds of routing equipment and something that's new, the Telos VX phone system. When a reporter or a photographer or truck operator calls in to the IFB call-in line, and it's just one number they have to remember or speed dial from their cell phone, they're automatically assigned to a position in this phone system. And that position is announced to them automatically by the asterisk phone system that intervenes between the SIP phone lines and the Telos VX system. So the reporter, photographer, truck operator knows exactly which position number that they are in. And it shows up on a screen that's available to the people who are producing all the incoming live shots. Here's a look at that position. The incoming live shot operator can talk back to any of the people who are on IFB with their cell phones. They can also then route that live shot to the production control room. And they have several of them here where news is produced. It's also possible to group the reporters together or the photographers together or keep them separate or keep them on their own individual IFB feeds. The reporters and photographers in the field get to listen to the program feed while they're out there. But when the news goes on the air live, then they're automatically switched to a feed of mix minus. 
That way, the producer or the director or the assignment editor or the live shot operator can talk back to any of the people that he or she needs to talk back to. The reporters and photographers, live truck operators in the field always hear the right audio. And there's no discrepancy, there's no ambiguity about who the director or producer is talking to. Instant, easy communications between those producing the news and those reporting the news are what this system is all about. Here at WSB, the inputs and outputs of the Telos VX system go to the Telex intercom system and also go to the Klotz audio routing system system for the audio consoles that are in the production control room. Of course, the whole system is networked. That means installation was easy and quick. Installing the gear was a matter of plugging in network cables to the network switches, assigning IP addresses, and then doing some configuration to allow the right phone lines to hit the right hybrids, and those to be grouped or not grouped as necessary, and then tied into the X nodes, and then on to the equipment such as the intercom system and the audio console that they connect to. The wiring was not only simple and easy, it was easy to make it neat. Take a look at the back of these VX systems and the back of the asterisk phone systems. You can see how clean and neat the wiring is because it's simple. So much is carried over IP, the voice over IP phone lines and the audio over IP network. So the advantages of using a Telos VX system to handle your television stations, IFB, and VIP phone callers for phone reports are these. Quick installation, far less wiring, a neat installation, easy integration with existing intercom systems and audio systems, and the best part, return on investment. These systems pay for themselves due to far lower telephone line costs because of using VoIP and SIP. In fact, there are even some lines between this system and the station's existing Cisco business phone system. That way, a VIP caller can call into the TV station and be easily routed into an on-air position with just a few button pushes. The engineers here at WSB Television tell me that they like using this system. And the operators, both in the field and here at the TV station, really enjoy the flexibility and reliability that they get. They get a lot of assuredness in knowing that the remote site that they want is routed to the right production control room. What about your TV station? Would you like to save perhaps thousands of dollars a month on phone lines? Of course you would. And the return on investment from this equipment works out anywhere from 18 months to about three years. You get a good return on investment when you switch to a much less expensive type of infrastructure, the telephone lines, and move to voice over IP and SIP. The Telos VX system makes that possible, makes it convenient, and makes it ultra easy to use and reliable. Moving over to a voice over IP system is good for reporters, photographers, truck operators, and producers and directors back at the TV station. It's also good for the people in the front office who pay the bills. I'm Kirk Harnack in Atlanta at WSB TV. All right, uh, Sean, I think you got a, a, a few things about orchestration to talk about. Sure, yeah, just to expand on this, I know we're a little over on time, so I'll make it quick, but um, you know, uh, as Kirk talked about, you, you, you can have voice over IP lines, and that's, that's great, but um, there, there's some other things that, are, that come with um, this newer technology. Um, so the old way of managing phone lines, especially in a TV station, we, we've seen photos like these or, or seen things like these ourselves, or just a bunch of desks, uh, a bunch of desks filled with, with phones. Um, in these facilities um, and you know this this old way was maybe you had a rack of, of fixed hybrids um, you know you don't really have much control and, and you don't really have any monitoring outside of maybe a, a homebrew a tally system um, using gpos um, and then again it looks just like a bunch of uh, desks um, filled with with phones maybe with some some hybrids accessible to the users right in front of them it has to be mounted right there in the control room uh, for tv especially um, so in kind of our, our modern era, when we move to broadcast voice over IP engines like the VX, we can create a, a unified um, technology or te telephony um, control and monitoring system where we can take IFBs and contribution audio and engineering cohort um, and integrate that with any existing systems and, and protocols like your intercom or your audio consoles, or your audio routing system. 
Um, what we can also do um, is we can create um, some really cool um, user interfaces, uh, user panels. Um, this slide next here shows a, um, um, oh, uh, this one just talks about some things we can do with VoIP orchestration. And these are a lot of things that we can do with, with the B set already, but sometimes, especially for, for TV production workflows, um, we need a, a bit more uh, control. Um, so to get that, what we can do is, is create these um, user panels. This is an example of, of a user panel we recently developed um, it took, uh, it's similar to what, what um, WSB is doing, but it took it into a, a kind of a new era with our, our new orchestration tools, um, where it shows um, all your IFBs, three columns, three studios, five IFBs in each studio, um, shows you caller ID if someone's connected, um, shows you what audio is routed, shows you input and output levels to that hybrid, you can drop the person, you can, um, using the keypad, fully multi-touch friendly, you can dial a person's number and hit dial, um, you can do talk back, um, et cetera. And there's a couple more um, views like for audio routing um, specifically where you can have a matrix view um, or maybe even something a little more custom on the next slide, which is basically having the ability to select, say, a, a hybrid uh, from a drop down list up on the upper left. And once you, all you do is you select the hybrid or you want to load up on a fader on the console, it not only loads up the fader on the console, it brings up the correct IFB on a key on your intercom system. Um, and, and displays audio levels and, and things like that um, across these different panels in the facility, um, as well as routing the mix minus and, and forward audio um, as needed. So um, we can do some, some pretty cool stuff, um, especially custom stuff. So um, if this brings up any ideas for you or your television facility, please get in touch and um, you know, we, can, we can do um, something that, that fits you know, what you're looking to do. And with that, Sean, that was awesome. Thank you very much, especially those last slides that really lay out uh, how that fits into a complicated television workflow. And uh, with the, you know, the word orchestration is, is, is new to me. I'm sure it's not new to people who manage larger facilities. It's a, it's a fun word to use. It sounds pretty fancy, but it really is what we're doing is we're taking a whole bunch of individual pieces and, you know, directing them to, you know, to work together. So um, it's pretty cool that we can, we can do that with some of the, the tools we have here um, with, with the VX and, uh, and Pathfinder that many folks are familiar with. I, I know that Steve Church uh, is very proud of uh, where we have gone and where the company has gone since the original Telos 10 uh, phone hybrid <laughs> from, from over 30, 30 yeah, some right. It all started when, uh, when, he, when someone just got annoyed with, with how calls sounded on the air, and then it kind of took off, took off from there. All right. I, I hope we've been able to convey some uh, information and learning. And uh, one of the most important things I, th I think Sean's talked about is if you need to get started with this and need to you know, choose a provider, uh, we can at least be uh, a, a reference uh, as to, you know, some people to, to check out if you need some help, help getting started and, and planning your move over to SIP. That's it.